The history of Aquileia, one of the most important archaeological areas of Europe, began in distant times in northeastern Italy. It began in a village of the 9th century BC, where products and goods coming from the territories of the Veneti and from the sea were exchanged and traded. Here, in 181, Rome set up a colony, from the beginning a military outpost, which eventually became a town, labelled centuries after as Menibus et Portu Celeberima, renowned for its walls and harbour. In an area which had always been a point of transit and trade between the Transalpine countries and the sea, and from the sea to the Mediterranean ports of the Near East, Aquilae developed a rich city centre with large public buildings, streets and neighbourhoods, luxury villas and monumental squares. Heavy merchant ships loaded with goods docked in the harbour surrounded by these distinguished imposing structures. The territory produced vintage wine and quality fruit for export. The many workshops specialised more and more in the production and manufacturing of bricks, pottery, metal, glass, amber and precious stones. Here in Aquileia, armies and emperors resided and passed by, engaged first in fighting, then in defending, now in winning, now in being defeated. The Edict of Constantine and the freedom of worship for Christians allowed the construction of the first cult buildings in 4th century Aquileia. In the southern building, where the medieval basilica built under the patriarch Popone now stands, the largest early Western Christian floor mosaic is preserved. Evangelization continued and expanded beyond the Alps, forming in time an enormous church province, where the bishops of Aquileia, who were named patriarchs as from the 6th century, were able to create a new culture formed from the meeting of three important European civilizations, German, Slav and Latin. There are stories that the earth conceals and the earth gives back, fragments of life and forms of memory, which are preserved in the National Archaeological Museum and which can be seen along an evocative route Collections of extraordinary importance, originating in the passion for antiquities of a Friulan canon of the 18th century, Gian Domenico Bertoli. In his house next to the basilica, Bertoli collected epigraphs, which he also had mounted. He drew, interpreted and preserved objects and finds which kept appearing on the surface of the fields around Aquileia. In the summer of 1807, the baptistry in front of the basilica received the finds and became the Museo Eugeniano. It was the first public institution of Friuli, which in this period was governed by the France of Napoleon. The region provided Napoleon Bonaparte with the symbol of the eagle with spread wings symbol of his power. It was a symbol which followed him throughout his long career. A few years later, in 1813, the museum closed, but the excavations in Aquileia kept going during the Habsburg rulership, under the direction of an imperial royal water inspector. Lists of the materials were drawn up and fines were bought. The law of the time allowed everybody to own ancient handiworks. Scholars and functionaries were persuaded, however, that the archaeological heritage must not be scattered, 
but should be reassembled and arranged again in a museum structure. So, in 1873, the municipality of Aquileia built a new town museum with considerable government funds. Yet the step was not enough in a site so rich in memories. It was not enough, especially for Enrico Maionica, a leading personality of the cultural life of those times. Following a master's degree in Vienna, he taught Latin and Italian at the grammar school of Gorizia, and he was a keen correspondent of the Central Commission, which safeguarded the heritage of the past within the imperial territories. New initiatives were promoted, and new proposals were put forward. In 1879, Emperor Francis Joseph approved the establishment of a museum, which this time must be under state control. The seat, here in a photo of that time, was the never-finished villa of the nobleman Cassis. Here on August the 3rd, 1882, the Cesarium Museum Aquileiense was opened in the presence of the Archduke Charles Ludwig. The first director was Enrico Maionica himself. Even in today's museum, the mark of his passion and of his careful yet curious work is still alive. An accurate exhibition which succeeds in putting side by side monumental remains and everyday objects, sumptuous jewels and plain handiwork. A journey into the past. The first room is devoted to the busts. What is still remaining of statues and sarcophagi recalls the flow of time. Each face is a person, each person a story, lost among thousands of others, yet more important than anyone else's. Old men, stern, noblemen, the first generations of Aquileia, Young women adorned with a fashionable hairstyle. Male faces at the height of their maturity. Eyes which look serenely at the things left behind. Tenser and more preoccupied are the faces of the sculptures of the third century AD, a period embittered by social and political strains. Looks which seem to search with anguish a distant vision, maybe a mirror of their own existence. The large statuary, an area which skillfully displays images of public figures and those of high rank, together with those of men and women to us unknown. Evidence, maybe, of old filial love these two married couples, who died within a generation of each other, were used as funerary monuments. The imposing statue, found in the countryside around Aquileia, the Navarca, portrays a man triumphant over the sea. Still without face, and without name. These three figures are carved out of marble with great attention to detail to celebrate the imperial household. Augustus dressed as Pontifex Maximus with veiled head, a sign of respect for the gods. Claudius in military garments, whose gesture seems to ask for attention for what he is about to say. Wrapped in her robes, a female statue, maybe Antonia Maino, daughter of Marcus Antonius, mother of the Emperor Claudius.
sit tibi terre levis. May the earth be light in this world of shadows. Here are the funerary monuments from the necropolis of Aquileia, which were erected as a pious act by the family or by the friends, or by whom had shared a life of work with these departed. The stone, in the shape of a helmet, commemorates a soldier who died far from his homeland. The scene depicted on a stele, depicting the workshop of a smith, has almost the force of a snapshot. The child, lying in a marble bed, is sound asleep. This is Hypnos, the personification of sleep, who is holding in his hand the opium poppy, whose sweet juice grants rest. He hugs a basket, the symbol of abundance, the youth with a thoughtful face. An intense dialogue of glances binds a woman and her soul, or a mother and her daughter whom death has separated. It's a ceremony of sadness, and at the same time of serenity, this banquet in honor of the dead, it is handed down for always by a stone urn. The statue of Venus, goddess of love and life, with her perfect body, which captures the light and gives it back. Impressive representations recount the world of religions, encompassing the public sphere and the intimate. They are linked to the memory of the ones who are no more. The altar of the De Parentes, the forefathers, on which, inside their tombs, sacrifices to one's own dead were made. The altar of Elpor, dedicated to Silvanus, sylvan deity who propitiates nature's rebirth. And again, the stone which generated Mitra, oriental deity, master of light, victor over darkness. The series of medallions, here in accordance with Enrico Maionica's wishes, which may be embellished a colonnade of the Forum, the monumental square of the ancient town, or of a high-level residence, the faces of Jupiter, Volcano, Mars, Rome, Mercury, Attis, Juno, Venus, staring at a distant point, invisible, almost lost in time. On the first floor by the old stairs, from sculpture to artistic handicraft, discovering objects which have in common the preciousness of the materials and the care of the workmanship. Iridescent colors sparkling, reflections of light on surfaces. The gems, semi-precious stones, transparent or opaque, flat or convex, destined to be the pride of a skillful collector, to adorn the neck, set in precious clasps, or fingers loaded with golden, silver and bronze rings. They were the means for explicit or confidential messages about material or spiritual realities. I worship Jupiter. I worship Mars. I am a votary of Venus. May you always be fair-haired. A 
Aquileia was the most important production centre of northern Italy. The arrival and departure point for the raw material, which was then worked for different markets. The red and the orange of the Carnelians, which came from the Alps. The green of the praises, which arrived from the east the violet of the amethysts, different coloured jaspers. The workshops were numerous and well attended, where skillful craftsmen created from a solid block the oval, round, faceted, big or very small gems to the buyer's delight. Each gem conceals an occasion to celebrate with a gift or a purchase, a small luxury, a great joy. Once again, the universe of the ancient religions here observed through common objects, bought in the sanctuaries and in the workshops to bring home the breath of the gods. Help and salvation from Isis, the ancient Egyptian goddess, guardian of women and of children. From Arpokrete, her son, child god, powerful and merry, whose image, as in this golden earring, brightened also female adornments. And from Apis, a deity who took the form of a bull. And from Osiris, who came back from the realm of the dead. Help from Mitra, served by the ravens, the new initiates, who as in these oil lamps, hid their faces under a long billed mask. Sistra was shaken beside the bed of a woman in labour for sweetening the pain by means of the hypnotic sound. Small bronze images were set in the Lararium, the altar placed in the atrium of the house, where before each meal the pater familias invoked protection. And if for Christians the flame of Jesus is the light of the world, oil lamps became a symbol, a symbol of God and of grace to be attained. Light, which becomes a golden reflection in the glass container depicting Moses whilst he is beating the rock. or of Jesus, whilst he is teaching the Apostles. Images which were understood by believers in a continuous dialogue with God. And light shed by this big pendant lamp of the 4th century, illuminated the four-sided portico before one of the two halls, the northern one, of the early Christian complex, which was built by Archbishop Theodorus. A bronze handmade piece of exceptional interest found in an excavation inside the area of the basilica which offered traces, maybe, of the big fire caused by the Huns of Attila in 452. Pottery, a fragile material and at the same time resistant enough to have reached our times through the centuries in the form of different household wear. Brilliant surfaces of black or reddish paint 
enriched by decorations, by inscriptions, which were maybe drawn to distinguish one's own dish from the others, or maybe to lay in a tomb and deliver a last message for the afterlife. Table earthenware, precious for understanding ancient society and its inevitable evolving tastes. Starting from the color black in the most ancient times, to the color red, invented in Arezzo around the middle of the first century BC. And then from the richly decorated Gallia kitchenware. Or from the shining surfaces of the East. Down to the African kitchenware with more plain decorations full of subtle meaning. And amphoras, also made of terracotta, which bear witness to the travels and contacts among the peoples living along the Mediterranean shores. Useful containers for carrying oil and wine, fish sauce, olives and fruit. Pottery even for the kitchen. Pots and pans used by skillful hands to cook plain food. Or elaborate and tasty dishes. Smells and memories of ancient tastes, as for instance the substantial breakfast based on eggs, meat and pine nuts, whose remains are still contained in a bowl from the end of the 3rd century AD. The meal was suddenly interrupted by a fire, which caused all the inhabitants of the house to flee. And terracotta enables us to enter also small secret worlds, like that of childhood, Revealed through games and toys, puppets, marbles and whistles, money boxes, small pots where one cooked for small bone dolls, children's games which tell us about a picture which is always different and always the same. From pottery to the room of metal objects, different and complementary aspects of ancient life. Objects in silver, bronze or iron, which accompanied the daily life of women and men, soldiers, officers and servants, doctors and musicians. Costly elements in the house furnishings, symbols of a social ritual, which enriched the reception rooms of a Roman house. Here the furniture was often decorated with metal, ivory or other precious materials. From the triclinia, on which one could eat, lying down, to the folding stools with foot-shaped feet, and also the furnishings talked to us in the language of luxury, the bronze branched candlesticks and oil lamps of refined forms, each one different from the other. At the banquets, food was eaten with fingers. Therefore, one always needed hot water for washing hands. Thus, these embossed bronze bottles from the 2nd to the 4th century AD, which are not unlike the thermos of today. Here, there are the drinking sets with this fine late antique wine jug decorated with medallions of female busts for a wine which was almost never drunk pure, but was diluted with hot water in winter and snow in summer. Mm -hmm. 
metal objects for the daily life of women and young girls, mirrors with their always carefully polished disc. It was said that a face reflected by a shining plate appeared more beautiful. Metal was also used for razors and strigils. These latter were curved tools for cleaning the skin, which was rubbed beforehand with oil and sand. The decorations of the chingula, the military belts, and buckles for cloaks were also made of metal. Here, this magnificent example of a parade helmet, made out of sheet iron, covered with silver, and decorated with small bunches of grapes. It was intended for a cavalry officer, and it may be dated to the first half of the fourth century AD. Rays of light pass through fragile surfaces. Bubbles conjured out of nothing in the workshops of skillful craftsmen. The glass handiworks of Aquileia, forerunner of Venice. They are extraordinarily well preserved, as much in quality as in quantity. Most of them originate from tombs, where the glass containers were laid as pieces of the funerary material and as an integral part of the burial rites in honour of the dead. The ashes of the dead called for perfumes, which were poured drop by drop out of the balm containers in order to give them peace. The ashes of women and youths were contained in glass urns Glass pots used for the conservation of fruit and of food preserves, evident signs of the conditions of inequality. Elegant glasses of sinuous forms, the infundibula, were produced. They were used to quench a thirst at banquets or by those who, beside the tomb of a beloved relative, drank as if to slake that parched thirst which the dead one would suffer during the long journey towards the dark afterworld. Rings and necklaces embellished those who were about to enter the Reign of the Shades. Coloured beads, fanciful forms and motifs. Small pearls decorated the girlish necklaces. More showy and bigger pearls signs of feminine pride and display of innocent vanity. Precious too were the pyxes with golden bands, like this one, which was used for keeping powders and cosmetics. Memories of a past life brought with her by a woman. The warm colour of the gold, it is vivid in its contrast to the gems. Jewels for looking at, for discovering and for feeling the same emotions of those who in distant times desired and bought these precious objects. At that time, in Roman society as nowadays, social happenings were marked by the ornaments, which were an expression of a comprehensible and essential language. Gold emphasised all ages of life. It was present at weddings in the shape of a ring, 
It took part likewise at births. It accompanied death, soothing the pain of the soul's passage to an unknown and frightening dimension. The jewels of Aquilaire mostly originate from female tombs, in which they were laid with precise purposes. If the deceased was a married woman, then the jewels allowed her always to preserve her beauty. If instead the deceased was a little girl or a young unmarried woman, gold represented the compensation for a life she did not enjoy. And one discovers customs, by now nearly forgotten, wearing rings on the smaller fingers in order to avoid wearing them on the middle finger, named impudicus or infamis, because of a vulgar gesture. And again, one imagines earrings with two or three pearl pendants hanging from the earlobes, jewels which the historian Plinius the Elder named crotalia, small castanets. The owner listened, pleased, to the tinkling of the pearls as they knocked into one another. And bad luck, frightened by the noise, would have kept away from her. She was maybe a priestess, the woman who, at the beginning of the second century AD, was cremated and buried with a small cylindrical pendant. A pair of sandals, decorated with golden ivy leaves. And a dress, or veil, whose fabric was marvellously embroidered with 203 tiny applique in the form of flies, which were patiently worked out of a very thin golden foil. These objects might recall Egypt, the goddess Isis venerated by women of any status. Drops of resin, honey-coloured, which the waves of the sea made as smooth as pebbles. Smooth surfaces like shot silk. In this room, one finds the most important collection of ambers ever retrieved from the ancient world. Aquileia, in fact, was the main working centre of the raw material coming from the Baltic Sea across the Alpine passes. Here it was worked and sold in all the regions of the empire. It was believed that amber, the Suchinum, had magic and therapeutic virtues because of its mysterious nature. If it is rubbed, it emanates an intense smell and it releases a charge of static electricity. That's why elegant trinkets were manufactured to cheer and embellish the house. Full relief small statuettes such as a group of Eros and Anteros, lucky and unlucky love, eternally struggling one against the other. And there are plenty of fancifully decorated rings. Female busts who are adorned with fashionable coiffures according to the style of the time. And there are also tiny objects, as the dice or the pawns, with which the game of life was played. Cosmetic and perfume containers with which women and young girls pursued beauty. Lastly, two of the most important finds recently found in Aquileia and unearthed from pits dug in the Forum. A very old bronze wall decoration depicting a wind, maybe the Bora, 
which blows hard in these lands. And a manly head of golden bronze. It depicts a middle-aged man, most likely an emperor. The traces of violent detachment from the bust might be the consequence of a sudden change of rulership sometime during the dark 3rd century AD. The last room, which holds the key to how everything we saw on display could be achieved, not only in the past, but also nowadays. Money. We enter a strong box where one can find bronze coins for the daily shopping. Give me six assi of bread, two assi of wine, or gold coins for other more costly wares. The collection includes more than 40,000 coins, out of which the most interesting classes have been selected, such as, for instance, the issues of the Aquileia Mint. The mint was opened up here by Diocletian in the last years of the 3rd century, and it was in service until 425. It supplied the troops, which were detached along the defence lines of the eastern borders, with bronze cash, that is, with their wages. An open area encloses the museum gardens. It forms the epigraphic gallery, built between 1898, jubilee year of the reign of Emperor Francis Joseph, and the 50s of the 20th century. It was conceived to house the big stone monuments which were discovered in Aquileia. Here, some of the most significant witness to both public and private architecture is on display, along with a corpus of inscriptions which prove how the town was an extraordinary meeting point of peoples of different languages and cultures. Great prominence is given to the funerary monuments within an organic picture of the different models in use during Roman times. Each of them provide us with useful information on social customs and spiritual beliefs. Imposing altars follow one after the other, with steles and sarcophagi, signs of mercy, and of family pride. Not only, here one also finds fine mosaics coming from the rich homes of Aquileia. And it is from one of the most ancient dwellings in town, the rare Azaroton, a mosaic floor. It depicts, by means of mosaic tesseras, a floor unswept after a banquet. and the rape of Europa, designed as a symbol of passion for adorning the wedding room. The threshold with a bow of twisted vine leaves once divided two rooms. Mosaic carpets even for the public buildings, as for instance in the complex of the large Terme, which dates back to the second half of the fourth century AD and is located in the western part of the town, between the circus and the amphitheatre. There is a special space devoted to the naval section, with this ship built out of oak, walnut and pine wood, dating to the 2nd century AD. It was recovered from the area of the ancient Lacus Timavi. Today, this environment is greatly modified. Here, not far away from the coast, there was an island, which was rich in thermal waters and on which a villa was built. Ships like this were used to link it to the dry land, 
and to other neighbouring houses. The museum offers another visitor's route, with the opening of the storehouses to the public. Spaces inside the building of the epigraphic gallery, which were organised in the middle of the last century. They form a series of communicating rooms, meant for keeping the materials brought to light by the archaeological excavations, and which are still coming out today, from areas of the ancient town and from the surrounding Aquilea countryside. In such a structure, which since the very beginning was intended to be open to the public, there are finds on display that, owing to a shortage of space, could not be permanently placed in the museum. An extraordinary occasion for visiting the backstage of the organisation of a complex cultural structure, which presents, arranged into classes, the materials which will be studied later on. From the epigraphic collections, to the sculptures, busts, fragments, heads of deities, funerary busts, The central room is completely surrounded with shelves full of finds, arranged and organised according to the typology. Here, on the floor, a mosaic coming from the area of the large terme was laid down. The last room, devoted to the sacred buildings with the remains of the terracotta decorations of two temples. Both of the second century BC, which the archeologists define as Etruscan Italic, typical of central Italy, from where most of the settlers, the founders of Aquileo, originated. Three thousand infantrymen received fifty ujera of land each, the centurions one hundred. An entire community was transferred here, so says the historian Titus Livius, and it performed the rite with which the perimeter of the new town was marked out. The Sulcus Primigenius, a holy ceremony whose image the museum still keeps, is fixed in this marble slab, beyond time and forever a form of memory.